welcome everyone. Today is March 7th and we'll call this meeting back to order at 6.43 p.m. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board members, may I please have a motion and a second that tonight's agenda be approved as submitted? So, so moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed, thank you. Board members, may I please have a motion and a second that the consent agenda as, or the consent agenda as listed in your agenda be approved? So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed, thank you. May I please have a motion and a second that the treasurer's report, including the cash report, general fund report, and school lunch fund report be approved as th the month ending December 31, 2022. So moved. Second. Questions or comments on that? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Thank you. And that brings us to special reports. Thank you. We do have a couple special reports this evening. I also do want to mention uh, for the community and those watching, we do have a smaller group. Uh, the Board of Education needs a quorum of four. And uh, so thankfully we're, thank you for being healthy. Um, so we do have, uh, due to uh, engagement and also due to illness, um, we have three board members missing. And then, um, the reason I was a little late coming in here is because I was working with our incredible uh, business administrator, Dr. Dan Driffel, who is not feeling well, so we sent him, um, but he was very helpful to walk me through everything. Um, so George, that's why Dan's not here, but don't worry, <laughs> I'll take care of you during your special report. Um, and so thank you. We do have two special reports. One is a special education update, and uh, the other is part of our budget annual budget review is George English, our director of facilities, will be uh, providing a facilities review um, as we look at the budget. And so I'll ask uh, Scott Drescher, our director of special education and PPS to come on up and I'll turn it over to Dr. Potter and Mr. Dressler to uh, start us off with our um, a special report on special education. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Putnam. Good evening, Board of Education, and good, good evening, community members. Um, we are excited to share that our district is looking to expand the continuum of special education services for our school age, kindergarten through fifth grade students with disabilities to now include integrated co-teaching services. Um, we have also reflected on how we provide direct consultant teacher services, which Mr. Dreschler, our Director of Special Education and Pupil Personnel Services, will speak to. Mr. Dreschler will also share an array of services as included in the New York State Continuum of Services and how it applies to our Penfield Central School District students with disabilities. Mr. Dreschler. Thank you very much, Dr. Potter. Thank you, Board of Education, for the opportunity to share. If you don't know, I'm very passionate about students with varying abilities and meeting their needs in all academic settings. So I appreciate the opportunity to share the great things that are happening in Penfield in the upcoming months and years. Um, when Dr. Potter expressed excitement, absolutely elated to be able to talk about some of the things that we're able to do in our continuum uh, to con continue to meet the needs of all of our students. So I'm gonna start in the broad area of New York State continuum of education, I would like to draw your attention to the five columns on the New York State continuum of special education services. And there are some words that are highlighted within those columns, one of which that you'll see across those columns is specially designed instruction. So when we talk about special education, we really are talking about specially designed instruction. And that means adapting the content, the methodology, the delivery of instruction to meet the varying needs of all of our students. So you'll notice that across all of those columns. The other thing I wanna bring attention to is you, as you go left to right from consultant teacher over to our special classes, I'll be talking about least restrictive environment. So least restrictive environment 
is talking about the setting, the location of where that specially designed instruction occurs. And as you start on the left side, it's occurring with your non-disabled peers is the language that they use. And as you go farther over to the right in our special classes, special class really means that location is in which there are not um, general education peers in that setting. So one of the things that New York State requires on their continuum of special education is the consultant teacher services. Consultant teacher services can be delivered in two ways. Direct consultant teacher services, which is a special education teacher pushing directly into the general education uh, classroom and indirect consultant teacher services where that special education teacher works behind the scenes in planning and adapting some of the individual um, assignments for students within that general education classroom. As you go to the right, you'll see integrated co-teaching. Integrated co-teaching is two teachers in the classroom and the time that they're in the classroom is determined by the Committee on Special Education, which I'll reference many times throughout here, whether it be the CSE, which stands for Committee on Special Education, but all of the decisions that are determined for an individual child are in partnership with family uh, through the Committee on Special Education. So if you start on the left side, the least restrictive environment as far as that consultant teacher, which is that special education teacher, pushes into the general education classroom, um, the amount of time is determined by that committee on special education. That could be very based on subject. So at different levels within Penfield already, um, at Bay Trail for example, um, we have different times that special ed teacher will be in there. Integrated co-teaching from the New York State lens, that's an optional component within New York State's continuum of special education. Again, we are very excited to be able to roll that out in Penfield. That's with a general education teacher and a special education teacher really determined by the Committee on Special Education. But we, con we consider that full time in there. They're partners, they're co-teaching, um, they're doing a lot of the things together to meet all of the needs of the students in there. Students with identified areas of need through an IEP and students that are not identified um, with areas of need are general education peers. As you go farther right in the middle, there's a resource room. So a resource room, really I would like you to pay attention to that supplementary instruction. So supplementary is in addition to access to the general education curriculum. So if you have an area of weakness within one um, academic setting, you may be pulled out for a resource room. It's a pull out program or service. It would be in a group of no more than five. It could consist of students with disabilities and students without disabilities, but the limit on that is no more than five students in a pull out setting. As you go farther right, special class 1211, the 12 represents the numbers of students within that program. The middle one represents the special education teacher, which is a required component, and the one is a teaching assistant or a supplementary support personnel. The one can vary based on the needs of the individual class. Students typically within that class are homogeneously mixed based on similarity of need. So they're grouped together based on the needs within that specific grade level or classroom so that that teacher can again deliver that specially designed instruction. As you go farther right, that's a 12-1-3-1. So again, 12 students max, one teacher. The three to one ratio is for every three students in there, you would have one supplementary aid or support personnel. That could be a teaching assistant, that could be an occupational therapist, that could be another related service provider for that child. The way that it's written within the New York State regulations is that is for students specifically, again, specially designed instruction, but you'll see it's looking at that, um, the purpose of that is different. It's looking at those life skills. It's looking at students with some significant cognitive or language areas of need that would impact their end result. So that's how New York State rolls out the continuum of services. The next slide talks about what we're gonna be doing in Penfield to meet the continued variability of our students as we move forward. So I'd like to kind of walk you through what may look familiar of what we've had historically. So if you look on the right side, the special class 1211, we've had a special class 1211, kindergarten through fifth grade, um, for as long as I have been here in Penfield. That special class starts at a building, for example, next year at Indian Landing, and then that stays through first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, and the child will continue through if they continue to be recommended through that Committee on Special Education for that special class. Um, those locations of those 
special classes are there for you to see. First grade will be at Cobbles, second or second grade at Indian Landing, um, third grade Cobbles, fourth grade Scribner, and fifth grade Scribner. The 12131, which is also that special class, that will continue to be placed at, or to be held at Harris Hill. Um, so that special program will be at Harris Hill. What is new for next year is if you look on the left side is the integrated co-teaching again. Integrated co-teaching, the way that it's described in the regulations is the presence of a general education teacher and a special education teacher full-time in that classroom. So students that are recommended for an integrated co-taught from the Committee on Special Education will have a number of hours on their IEP with two teachers on there. There are limits when we talk about the makeup of those classrooms. So when we think about the numbers of students overall in an elementary classroom, the way that it's written in the regulations is that within these integrated co-talk classrooms, you can have no more than 12 students identified with disabilities. That's any student with an IEP within that classroom. So the limit is at 12. The makeup of that class in turn is no more than 50% of the total class can be identified with students with disabilities. So if you have 12 students with IEPs, there can be no more than 24. They could, 24 could be on there. You could have 25, 26, but you could have no less than 24 students in that place. So there's a limit of 12 with a maximum of 50% of the total classroom population. So we are having integrated co-taught classroom locations aligned with our special class locations. So there's reasons behind that thought process. So we've rolled this out at Bay Trail four or five years ago, utilizing a direct consultant teacher model, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. But typically, students that historically we have looked that possibly may be appropriately placed in a 1211. We're looking very closely at the needs of those students through that committee to see if that determination is such where an integrated co talk could be a great location for that child to be able to access that general education curriculum. So, the goal really overall, when we talk about the continuum of special education and what New York State and Penfield strives to do, is to educate students in a location and a program as close to their general education peers as possible. Rolling out integrated co-taught is exactly what we're able to do with that model. They are with their general education peers all day um, and they're still accessing the same standards and the same end goal as that regions and local diploma with their gen ed peers. So that location is aligned with our special education classrooms, our special classes. So if you look again on the right side, 1211 is Indian Landing. We'll have an integrated co-taught at Indian Landing as well in the kindergarten classroom or grade level. And first grade cobbles, just like our special class cobbles. One of the things that we're also doing um, through the Committee on Special Education, through partnerships with our families and our teachers and staff, is looking at that consultant teacher model so I'm going to go back one slide. When you look at that consultant teacher model on the left, you look at the direct consultant teacher. So that's the presence of a special education teacher in that general education classroom. There's similarities between an integrated co-taught and a direct consultant teacher model in that both of those models have the presence of a special education teacher in them. So if you are a child that is in first grade not at Cobbles. Say you're a child in first grade at Scribner and you're going through the Committee on Special Education process. The CSC may consider an integrated co-taught, but we're also expanding our ability to meet the varying needs of students within all of our elementary schools. And we're doing that through an increase in allocation of time from a special education teacher in our core content areas. So if you think about a child that has first grade and they go to their ELA block, which is 60 minutes, the CSC can consider or will consider, does the child need 30 minutes of consultant teacher direct special education support? Does the child need an hour of special education support? So the CSC will consider possibly an hour of direct push in special education support within that ELA block. They may also consider through that committee an hour of math support of direct special education teacher support in there. So that's the, some of the similarities between, excuse me, the integrated co-taught model 
that's in the locations on the left and how we're able to build capacity in all of our buildings that don't have that integrated co-top model. We're able to look at that direct consultant teacher model, which is the presence of that special education teacher to help deliver that specially designed instruction. At the bottom, we also have the resource room, which is a required component of the New York State continuum of, of, of education and the related services. They're all determined frequency by that committee on special education. Um, the reason that there's a difference between integrated co-taught and direct and indirect consultant teacher model, the direct indirect consultant teacher model, there's a minimum of service whenever you think about recommending consultant teacher and resource room. So that allows flexibility with how you can mix resource room with a direct consultant teacher. But for next year, we're very excited again to align our integrated co-taught classrooms within the location of where we currently align our 1211 classrooms. And then also at the same time, building capacity in all of our four elementary buildings that don't have the integrated co-taught through that direct consultant teacher model. Thank you. So I'm just gonna speak quickly to the family communications that we've already um, had in place and some future communications that we will engage in. So we informed families on February 13th that we were looking to expand our continuum. We held a family information session on February 28th. On March 1st, there was a SEPTA meeting and there was an opportunity for additional questions or wonders to be considered um, and discussed during that meeting. Um, tonight we have our Board of Education meeting and we're sharing with our community. And February until the end of the school year, we will have our Committee on Special Education meetings with our families where we will determine what services and programming will look like for our students with disabilities. And so next steps include for us partnerships, um, partner, a continued partnership with our families. We wanna work with our family Families as the school team explain services as aligned with New York State Education Department's continuum of special education services and the Committee on Special Education meetings, which could include an initial eligibility meeting, re-evaluations, and annual reviews where it's discussed and determined that services may or may not change because these decisions and determinations are made by the CSC based on student data for academic achievement, functional performance and learning characteristics, the levels of knowledge and development in subject and skill areas, including activities of daily living, level of intellectual functioning, adaptive behavior, expected rate of progress in acquiring skills and information and learning style. And so um, as we're continuing this update, I'm going to push back to Mr. Dreschler, who's going to talk a little bit about Inclusion Week and how we've been acknowledging inclusion in our district. Thank you so much, Dr. Potter. So Inclusion Week is something that we've typically partnered with our Special Education Parent Teacher Association. So we're very excited to be able to, to partner with them whenever we re-roll some of these initiatives and great word out. Um, so it started, we did midweek to midweek. So there's been a theme each day. The theme this year for Inclusion Week is going all inclusive. Um, so what that means in Penfield looks a little different for every single child. So we try to um, celebrate the differences. And what we did is we looked at some of the videos sometimes, they lend themselves to great discussion points. So part of our morning announcements and part of that SEL block, which was great to be able to, to allow this to occur at the elementary level specifically, is you show a video and then you talk about some of those, the components of how you can be inclusive. Um, one of the things also that we've done over the years is Tina Fitzroy in talking about Tina's trunk. She talks about her personal journey and she has been to or will be at all of our elementary schools to share that journey um, with our students. So she's always been a great contact with us. And then last week, um, again, in collaboration with our SEPTA, our Special Education Parent Teacher Association, um, Dr. Quo came and presented on from the U of R and he works with Strong Behavioral. He's the um, chief developmental and behavioral um, doctor over there. We have the strong consultants that we partner with that really support our classrooms and our individual students. So he talked about the blueprint for change. 
and me giving you my summary of that, um, really talking about how they're continuing to plan in the medical field to support the varying needs of students with diverse um, um, medical needs and academic needs. And he talked about, and we were able to talk about, the partnerships that schools and the medical field also form in that continued collaboration to meet the needs of all of our students because you can't have one in isolation. So we've worked very closely with our strong consultants, and it was great to have Dr. Quo coming to present because it's just he's, he's the backbone and he really s presses the partnership and the continued collaboration between the two fields. And then last but not least, the inclusion yes, banner. Yes, that is today or maybe tomorrow. So the inclusion banner signing is such where it's, it's both of my daughters have talked about it every single year, um, where they go into the cafeteria, and that's where students all come together. It can be led by sometimes varsity um, athletes. They're at a table, or sometimes some other people have come and talked about why it's important to be inclusive of everybody, um, no matter the needs, no matter anything that they may be working through. Thank you. Questions? Board members, questions? We're going to sign the banner, I think. It's here yes. somewhere. Yeah. We have a, we have a, so we're gonna, yes, we have a banner right hey, here hey. for board members uh, uh, to sign before the high school students even sign it. So Ooh, I thought they signed fancy. it. Already. No, right. they're going to do it tomorrow. I'm so going to sign it. Depends. Yep. No, I'm just <laughs> board members, questions for mm -hmm. Mr. Dreschler or Dr. Potter? No. No, we actually had the opportunity to hear a little bit of this in depth at the workshop, so I was not able to hear Dr. Quo speak because um, I really wanted to hear him speak on uh, on the children and youth, right, with special health care needs grant. It is recorded. Yeah. It is. Oh, it is. Okay, All the good. presentations good. are on so our website. So he actually yes. has a background um, federally, I think, in working on the maternal child health care grant, so I think you know, they, they wooed him and got him here to the U of R from somewhere else. So I think he's really going to be a great, a great addition to uh, our partnership. But back to what we're doing. I'm so excited. And the board was so excited and really asked a ton of questions um, at our workshop. So I don't have, I have like a really strange technical question for you. <laughs> which I'm just going to ask because I'm going to. So tell me, when we're, when we're listing this new on the IEP, do we have to list this in hours, or is it going to be a placement? So typically we try to be as specific as possible okay. through that committee in special education. So we'd like to do it because some students, it can be subject specific. So you could have integrated co-taught ELA block for 60 minutes. You could have integrated co-taught mm -hmm. math. Right. So we try to be subject specific. Mm -hmm. um, some students may have it for um, two of those blocks. But yes, because there is fluidity within the recommendations of that CSE, it would be subject specific. Yeah, no, that's great. And we had a lot of discussion about how planful this was. Um, so really kudos to this team for the, the work that you did to, to really roll this out. Um, we're very excited about how inclusive it will be for all our students and just really adding that other layer of um, individual what's that word that I'm trying to say individualized, individualized yes mm -hmm. um, planful right to meet needs mm -hmm. it's very exciting and and to your point the individualized approach right that we're taking to make sure that each student's plan is tailored to meet their needs and our continuum will now provide opportunities for growth and experiences across a grade level um, different than we've been able to provide in the past. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I wasn't able to touch about is just peers learning from peers, yeah. which is also one of the great benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the, and, uh, Mr. Dressler referenced it and referencing Bay Trail and having um, the integrated co-taught there. And I think about that with the question on what's on the IEP because it would look different at a secondary level because that's why it's subject specific because if it's just ELA, ELA, block at the high school is 40 minutes so it would be 40 minutes a day for ELA the the and it's a I think for the community too as I look at this is is while um, ICOT is new for K5 we have had it in place now at the high school and Bay Trail 
with success of students coming together. Um, you know, I had a student, my own, who I didn't realize was in um, an ICOT class until I happened to realize there were two teachers. Because it's not something that, you know, if, if for gen ed students, again, that building peer to peer mm -hmm. and having two uh, professionals working in that classroom is really incredible. And as we look at that inclusion piece, we know that in our schools, uh, the only place you have to be an expert in everything is uh, high school in New York State because there's so much you have to get through and be an expert in. But we know in the real world beyond that, you can really specialize in what you want to uh, continue doing. And so, again, it's that piece around inclusion and really looking. I give kudos to Mr. Dressler, Dr. Potter, and all of our uh, principals and our teachers um, who have been in our SEAs who have been really involved in the work and digging into how we can um, strengthen that continuum to really support kids at, in at least, respect, least restrictive ways whenever possible. So it's a big lift, but one that we appreciate the board support in that communication. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about budget in terms of impact of some, there is some new staffing that comes along with it, but we're able to do that in a, in a positive way. Mr. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right. So we do have a, another board presentation. Mr. English, our uh, director of uh, facilities. So beat that. No, I'm just yeah. All right. <laughs> no, that was great. I was kind of thinking that as I sat there for a bit. So as we look at our um, um, annual budget, as we prepare the budget for the 23-24. Uh, school year. Um, part of this, our process is, as you remember, we had our Director of Transportation, Mike Gala, at the last meeting, sort of giving a year in review, and now we've got our Director of Facilities. So I'll turn it over to you, George. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me and giving me a chance to just give you a quick update on facilities. Um, actually, year over year, uh, it's looking very good. So I'm going to have a nice report. Um, for, you know, I'm going to go just quickly over the where, where we're at with our schedule with our transportation and facility center. Uh, take a quick look at our budget and uh, current funding levels. Talk a little bit about our staffing and payroll, and then I got a couple of people I'd like to recognize quick. So, so our transportation and facility center, um, we had approval from the architect and engineers at SED early December. We just finally got the project manager to give us some response <laughs> last week. We responded right away, SEI did. So they, they got their response to her questions back within a day. And we were hoping that by the end of the week we would have her approval. We don't have it yet, but hope we... It's early. Any it's day, early. any day, any day this we week. As long as we get it this week, we'll be great because we'd like to to uh, put the project out to bid next Monday, the 13th, uh, and then th have it on the street for five weeks, open bids on the 19th of April, um, get Board of Education approval on the 26th of April, and then hopefully on a nice sunny May evening, break some ground out at 1340 Jackson Road. So, so yeah, exciting. so that that's our hope, um, you know, I don't think we're too big a dreamers yet, no. so <laughs> that's where, where, where that stands. So hopefully all, all goes well. Hopefully we hear back from Wendy in the next day or so. As long as we do, we're, we're in great shape. Uh, current funding levels, uh, rising costs are impacting our department, and most of those rising costs are labor-related. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are still adequately adequately able to provide clean, safe, and healthy environment for our students and staff, which is the most important. We have the equipment we need. We're able to repair, replace the equipment as needed. The biggest challenge has been getting companies to bid, especially on dump trucks, pickup trucks. <laughs> but we just did a bid for a dump truck, and we actually got a couple of responses, so we, that was encouraging. Uh, we can properly maintain all of our buildings, our parking lots, well, we, we are doing well despite the challenges financially. Uh, we're able to afford to continue doing summer projects as we have in the past, both internally and using some external folks. We'll do some paving again this year. Uh, we'll have some carpeting done in a few offices, those kinds of things. You know, they're not capital improvement worthy type projects, but 
there are things that make it better for our students and staff. And then, uh, you know, just, you know, one of the biggest things from a payroll and just cost standpoint is, like I said already, cost of outside contractors, it, the, the, it, it's more and more difficult to get them to come here and more and more difficult to pay them because they need more money. And, it, and it's just all driven by, you know, their labor costs. And so that is impacting a little bit our maintenance mechanics shortage, but I'll touch on that in the next slide. So maintenance mechanics, we still have four vacancies out of 11 positions. The good news is we, we did just post again. When we posted our maintenance mechanic, we posted our painters, we posted our cleaners, which we almost always have posted. But we do have a candidate for our maintenance mechanic one position. And uh, the, the good news is we have a candidate. The bad news is Churchville might be losing somebody. Mm -hmm. That's part of the problem. <laughs> um, it, you know, th these two first two positions, maintenance mechanic and painter, you know, where we're at pay-wise, it just makes it a little difficult to recruit. Grounds, we're in great shape, no vacancies. Cleaners, we have 5.5 out of our 44 positions, and actually I have two applicants that I'm interviewing this Friday. So. Um, again, we're, we're doing much, much better as far as cleaners. No vacancies with our custodians, no vacancies with our office clerks. So right now, year over year, I'm at 10 and a half vacancies versus last year I was at 13 and a half. Actually, if I fill the, with the four external applicants I have, I'll be down to six and a half. So it's less than half. So it, it's great. We're, we're, we're doing very good and I'm, you know, I'm pleased with our direction. Um, so, the uh, gentleman on the left in the screen is Wilbur. We hired Wilbur about 16 months ago. Wilbur is legally blind. We hired him to clean. Some people would laugh at you. At the time, he needed a job, we needed help. We put him in a position at the elementary school. It didn't go awesome. You know, Wilbur was trying, Wilbur was doing everything he could. We moved Wilbur to the high school. Ray Young is now his supervisor. He's the uh, second shift custodian. And thanks to Ray's leadership and guidance, Wilbur is doing awesome. That's Wilbur great. is part of the team. Uh, this is you know, the win-win we were hoping it would be when it all started. And just as an example, we had uh, our annual training day on February 24th uh, during winter break. And you know, I didn't have, you know, I knew Ray was doing a great job with Wilbur, but Ray went and picked Wilbur up because Wilbur normally uses public transportation to bring him to training. He, it was in, at Bay Trail, a building Wilbur's not familiar with. The whole day, Ray is watching over Wilbur and making sure he's good, getting where he needs to go, not running into the wall, just phenomenal. So. Can't say enough about the job Ray's done, so I really appreciate Ray. The next gentleman is John Toms. Um, John was our lead HVA mechanic a little over a year ago. George Corbett retired, and so we hired John to be the labor foreman. Um, at that time, uh, there was another experienced maintenance mechanic in our department. Uh, shortly after John took the position, that maintenance mechanic left us for another opportunity. Um, and so John was in a situation with me where we had like no experience whatsoever other than John. <laughs> John, uh, we were able to hire three maintenance mechanics. One, one we hired from internal, but John has done an amazing job training them. Now, the good thing is, we, you know, we get, we're not able to get people that have a lot of experience necessarily. So we're able to train them to do things like we want them to do it. And that mm -hmm. they, they listen for the most part. <laughs> and, and so that, that's the good thing. But the bad thing for John, all year he was the only guy on call. So every weekend mm -hmm. he had to mind his P's and Q's because he never knew when he might be getting called. 
Now, uh, he's got another person in the HVAC department who's now up to speed and is able to cover being on call every other weekend. So, uh, but I just want to recognize John because I don't know what I'd have done the last year without him. So, he, he's done a great job for us. So, um, anyways, um, oh, I thought there was a questions, comments, but. No, I just, uh, well, there, there will be. But oh. the other piece, because it was before your time with us, is John Toms started as a high school hall monitor. Correct. And, yep. and then moved to facilities. And so, again, that piece of, like, always looking and, and sort of, you know, within our, within our district, being able, people yep. who are interested to sort of, right. sort of rise and shift. And, and uh, so, again, John's got a, a long history here, and I appreciate you yeah, sharing. Yeah, John's a great story. Yep. I'm very, and it, I, I didn't say it, but he has an awesome sense of humor, too, as you can see by the picture. That is <laughs> like, John's like, mm -hmm. That was about the fourth picture I took. I'm like, all right, John, <laughs> it's going to be a happy picture. That's <laughs> so. Oh, that's funny. Board members, questions for George? No questions. I have a question for you, George. Okay. Can you tell me what a maintenance mechanic does? Because my brain goes to like okay. the bus mechanic, which I know that's not so, what you mean. Right. So we ha we have a maintenance mechanic one. Their focus is uh, HVAC, which is heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. Okay. And then we have maintenance mechanic twos, which they do carpentry, plumbing, electrical type work in in the buildings. Got it. All right. So that makes sense. Why yep. that it's difficult mm -hmm. to find. Correct. You know. Yep. They're mm -hmm. you know skilled trades, we, and we have two people that work uh, B shift, Bill uh, Vasili and uh, Troy Thomas. Uh, I'd say Vasili's last name, but I'd, I'd screw it up. So th they're the A team. We call them the A team. They, they work every day from 2.30 to 11.30 at night. I, they are phenomenal. They yeah. can do anything. And I mean, they're skilled it, repairing tile, doing carpentry, hanging cabinets. They sometimes get dirty jobs of cleaning, you know, plunging sanitary lines, but they'll do whatever they need to do and they do a phenomenal job. And I'm very grateful for those two guys too, but so. That's wonderful. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. So George, I just wanna, I really appreciate that positivity that you bring when you come and report. Um, now, Life isn't always so rosy and everything. Not always. <laughs> Not always. Especially but when you're... But you, always, bring, you always do bring some bright spots, and I do appreciate that. I think that's very nice that you recognized the people that you recognized tonight. It's a nice thing to do, and it makes working for someone like you... I would think a little easier. Uh, no, but, it's not. You know, it's, it's hard. <laughs> no. <laughs> they might not tell you that, but I'll, I'll, I would just venture to guess that when they drive home at night, they feel appreciated. And I think uh, that's important, and I think it's nice that you did that, and I appreciate that you did it, and I wanted you to know that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate them. I, it shows. I need all of them. Yeah, yeah it shows. That's what important. I'm talking about. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. thank you. All right, thank, thank you, you for the time. Appreciate it. That concludes uh, special reports. Alrighty. All right, now we're on to our student representative report. Layla. Um, good evening. So at PHS, um, over February break, students went to Italy with the social studies department. So the trip included stops at the Colosseum, Ro Rome, the Vatican, and Sorrento. Um, for Valentine's Day, the class of 2025, their class council sold carnations where students could buy flowers and write notes on them, and they were delivered to their peers throughout the school day. So that was really fun seeing everyone doing that. Um, the PHS mock trial team won a close competition against Mercy, and March is always really busy at the high school. Um, Model UN is having its final conference this weekend at St. John Fisher. The sophomore semi-formal is this upcoming Friday. DECA, the business club, is competing at States this weekend. The indoor track team is also competing at Nationals in Boston. And next weekend at Lemoyne College, the Science Olympiad team will compete at States. Um, at Bay Trail, the drama club is presenting Mary Poppins Jr. this weekend on Friday and Saturday. 
And um, Malcolm Subban of the Buffalo Sabres came to Bay Trail to talk about his experiences and answer questions from students. At Harris Hill, there's also the um, Lion King Kids Show, which are also on Saturday and Sunday. Fifth graders went to the Challenger Learning Center at Harris Hill, and then at Cobbles for Black History Month, PHS students in the, our Black Student Union went to Cobbles classrooms for a read aloud. At Scribner, um, Scribner is having its annual family bingo game this Friday night, and students are designing paper bridges to hold the weight of as many pennies as possible. And lastly, at Indian Landing, the Indian Landing red and white basketball game is this Friday. And first graders join classes for a lesson in American Sign Language. Mm -hmm. oh, Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Questions for Lila, board members? No, oh, that's great. I'm, I'm happy to hear that the elementary schools are getting back to doing their mm -hmm. productions because I know that was sort of on hold with COVID. And right. yeah, so it's, it's really nice. It's nice to hear. Thank you. And that brings us to superintendent reports, Dr. Um, Putnam. I think our student rep took care of it for me, <laughs> but, but um, just a few. We've got uh, for uh, superintendent reports. I've got some student and staff honors briefly, and then um, uh, I actually don't have any PCSD updates. So it's just a slide and then questions. So you can just ask me questions. And then we have a wonderful UPK update from Dr. Maloney, and then um, a great business update from Dr. Driffle, which will be done by me. So I thought I, I was, I, I thought I, I planned this where I wouldn't be talking a lot, but, mm -hmm. but Dan's got, got one on me. So, um, but real quick, just in terms of um, updates is our Monroe County uh, Music All County Festivals. Uh, congratulations to the Penfield students who've been selected to participate in the All County Music Festivals during the month of March. Again, incredible uh, musical um, hard work. I always try to stay away from talent because I know it takes incredible hard work to, to um, uh, be so focused on uh, music. And so in, in our agenda, I believe those names are listed, but elementary 32 students, uh, junior high, they refer to as junior high in the All County is 25 students and senior high is 20 students. So congratulations again to all of our All County um, students. Inclusion Week, as Mr. Dresser talked about, uh, we celebrate Inclusion Week um, from March 1st to 7th, uh, and students and staff participated in theme days and learned how to uh, be more inclusive through uh, videos and activities throughout the week. Uh, the week cultivated with an, um, a going all inclusive poster signing. And um, the spread the word to, it really is a spread the word campaign, it used to be the spread the word to end the word focused on the R word as a, obviously as a negative uh, put down for, for anybody with a disability. Um, but this is just as a reminder, like it's, it's great work that we're continuing to do, but we for years and years partnered with uh, SEPTA, our parent organization. So uh, inclusion week is something that really started as a, as a day. Um, many years ago and has continued to build out to, to a, a full week. And again, just a great opportunity to, um, when we talk about equity, um, this is one of those areas. So this is about equity, about making sure that students, um, all students feel included in things. And while it's focused on um, students with disabilities, it really is the all students who um, um, we want to make sure that we're being inclusive with. So great work there. And then sock donations, our incredible uh, Penfield High School robotics team, 1511, who I uh, put a plug in this weekend is, are at um, um, RIT for their event. That's this Friday and Saturday, I think. So that's open to the, the public to go and see our robotics team competing in um, a partnership with Bombas. Uh, they uh, were able to donate 10,000 pairs of socks to 13 community organizations over the past few weeks. So again, um, with many of our clubs and our extracurricular activities and athletics, it's really not just about the event, but also about giving back. And so that's a great opportunity. Questions on my positive members, statements? Questions? Um, no, not about socks. Okay. No questions, no questions on questions socks. socks. No. It was great. It was a good job. I actually don't have any specific updates besides the other things you're going to hear about this evening. Any questions on my update? <laughs> <laughs> Just a holdover slide. Yeah. How long did it take you to put that together? <laughs> that took me no time because I have an incredible assistant in Kathleen who sits here, so um, she keeps me on track. Nice but, job, Kathleen. Yep. Thank you. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Maloney for uh, an update on universal pre-K. Yes, good evening. Tonight I will be 
sharing some updates relative to next year's UPK program. And for those in the community and the board, just a reminder, this is our first year with Universal Pre-K. Um, we are currently um, in our first year, 116 students. And it is really, I, every time I get a chance to visit or talk about the program, it, it really is um, an awesome opportunity for kiddos. So looking forward to next year, just a reminder, um, the program is New York State grant funded. It is a full day program, five and a half hours, including free meals, offering a social, emotional, and play-based curriculum aligned with the New York State pre-kindergarten standards. Based on the New York State Department, excuse me, New York State Education Department allocations, Penfield has 116 UPK spots available, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We will operate within four local community-based organizations. The Browncroft Daycare um, will have 36 spots. The Carolot in Fairport will have 18 spots. Children's Continuous Care will have 30 spots. Crayon Campus, you'll see this is a new location, um, will have 32 spots. And just a reminder, um, families will need to provide transportation. Transportation is not a part of the funding from the State Education Department. And I recognize that families in the community have many questions regarding UPK, particularly because it's such a new program. And I know, Kristen, at last week's um, Indian Landing PTO meeting, you um, some questions were raised specifically to you. I've tried to incorporate many of those common questions into tonight's presentation, and families can also check out the UPK page on the district website. So if you're looking at the district website, on the left-hand side, there is a UPK link, um, takes you right to the UPK page, lots of information right there. Um, and for families with children eligible for UPK in the 23-24 school year, Mary Sapone and I will be hosting an information session tomorrow night at 7 p.m. That session will be virtual and the link for the session can be found on the district's website on the UPK page. When you're looking at the district's website, it, there's a UPK menu option on the left-hand side. So speaking of Mary Sapone, uh, I will mention her name a few times tonight. She's presented for the board in the past, but just I want to make sure that the community is aware. Mary is the district's chairperson for the committee on uh, preschool spe special education, as well as the district liaison for UPK. And she does a fabulous job overseeing all of which is incorporated with UPK. So a common question that we receive, why are there only 116 UPK spots when an average graduating class in Penfield is about 350 students? Great question. So the New York State Education Department allots funding for UPK within districts, as well as the number of spots associated with that funding. And in Penfield, the State Education Department allocates our district 116 spots. So we look each year to um, enter into partnerships with community-based organizations to fill all of those 116 spots. So as I mentioned, Cran Campus in Pittsburgh will be uh, starting a new partnership with, for UPK with the district pending the board's approval tonight of Cran Campus's request for a uh, proposal. As you may recall, the Bayview YMCA is not interested in continuing the current UPK partnership for the next school year. And so the district then um, opened up an RFP process, a request for proposal process, and um, tonight we're hoping for your approval to um, approve Crayon Campus's uh, RFP. So in each of the requests for proposal that each um, community-based organization submits, they indicate um, that they want to partner with the district to offer UPK, and the CBO also notes the number of students they are able to accommodate. 
So by contracting with all four of the CBOs, we're able to offer all 116 allotments, um, as well as provide families with various locations. So a common question that we receive is, do CBOs need to be located within the school's catchment? No. So per the New York State uh, Education Department, districts have the ability to contract with CBOs outside of the district. So as the chairperson for the committee um, on preschool special, special education, Mary Sapone has standing relationships with many of the daycares in the immediate area. So in fact, she reached out to approximately 30 locations to let them know that we were looking um, for locations to partner with and to gauge those uh, CBO's interest in partnering for UPK. So obvious, so a location obviously needs to have the space available and be interested in all aspects of um, the UPK partnership. So that includes the program being the five and a half hours in length each day. They need to follow the district's curriculum. They need to follow the school calendar. So when that request for proposal window is open, uh, Kim Adorante, the district's purchasing agent, publishes the opportunity for any CBOs, not, not only those that Mary has reached out to personally that she has relationships with, but any CBOs in the area to submit requests for proposals. Um, and she publishes that through multiple arenas. Um, and then we respond accordingly. So a typical follow-up question is, are these CBOs partnering with other school districts in addition to Penfield to offer UPK? So could my child be in a, in a UPK class with a student from another district? At this time, all CBOs that we are partnering with are only partnering with Penfield for UPK. So I do want to clarify, it is possible for a CBO to place additional children in a UPK class to reach that average class size of 18. Because as you'll see from the slide, for example, Children's Continuous Care has 30 Penfield UPK openings. So they may choose to have a class of 18 and a class of 12 students. And then they may elect to fill that class of 12 with six students outside of the Penfield UPK program. In that situation, continuous care is able to um, charge those families. Those families could come from wherever um, families that, that go to that um, CBO come from. So it wouldn't necessarily be a Penfield student. A question that came up at the recent Indian Landing PTO meeting was, why does the district partner with outside organiza organizations for UPK? Why is the UPK pro program not housed within our own Penfield schools? Again, great questions. Um, part of the requirements actually from the state education department are that districts partner with CBOs. And then in addition, from the district's perspective, we don't have this we don't currently have the space within our schools to house the upk program so lots of lots of great questions i'm hoping i can uh, cover a number of those the next slide so similar to last year the upk program will follow the district calendar and run from september through june wrap around care is available at some of the cbo's if a family elects to um, take advantage of that wraparound care, they need to incur the cost. The program is open to children who will be four years old on or before December 1st, 2023. Children who are age eligible to attend ki kindergarten are not eligible for UPK. This is a question that we, we do um, get. Students will be selected to participate through an equitable lottery system. The average class size will be 18 students with one teacher and one paraprofessional. And then of course I did put another plug in that when you are looking at the Universal Pre-K Quick Link on the website, when you're looking at the website, it's on the left-hand side in the menu column. Um, you, when you click on that link on the UPK page, you can find um, the community session video, I'll talk a little bit about that, and FAQ and the application. So when families um, 
uh, fill out the UPK application, the location of all four CBOs are listed as well as whether wraparound care is available at that particular CBO. And again, remember families would need to incur the cost of wraparound care. Also on the UPK application, families have the option to rank their preference for the CBOs in addition to indicating whether the family would like to be put on a, late, on a wait list. So a common question, and I know Kristen, you received this question um, when you were at Indian Landing. So a common question relative to the lottery, can the lottery be needs-based? And the state education department is very clear that the lottery cannot be based on any needs or demographics. So no preferences can be given. I think it's helpful for families to know that for this current school year, 179 students applied for the 116 placements. And through the lottery process, all 179 students were offered a placement at least once um, some families multiple opportunities because when a family is offered to accept placement, they can choose to accept, they can choose to go to the bottom of the wait list, they can choose to withdraw completely. And some families opted, oh, we'll, we'll go on the wait list and, and we'll wait for um, if they wanted a particular location or not. The maximum class size for a pre-kindergarten class is 20 children. And for up to 18 students, there must be one teacher and one paraprofessional assigned. For classes of 19 or 20 students, there must be one teacher and two paraprofessionals assigned to each class. And the teachers must be certified in early childhood, which is why um, I just wanted to mention that that's where the average class size of 18 students uh, comes into play. So let's review the timeline. So tomorrow night at 7 p.m., Mary Sapone and I will hold a virtual community information session. During this session, we will share information regarding the program and answer families' questions. Bet you can't guess where the link to the uh, <laughs> session is located. It's on the district website. If you're looking at the district website, it's on the left-hand left side, side, yep, there's a UPK <laughs> link. Okay. Just want to make sure folks know where to go. We plan to record the session and post it on the district website. We recorded last year's, and um, families found that to be very helpful, so we'll continue that. And um, families with children eligible may have received an email with information about the virtual community information session if the family is already in the district student management system. So you may have already received at least one or two emails, and that would have the direct link. Um, enrollment will open on March 15th, and interested families can find the, the application by clicking on that universal pre-K quick link <laughs> on the left-hand side of the district's homepage. Enrollment ends April 7th, and the lottery process will take place shortly thereafter. The uh, New York State Education Department requires the school districts establish that random process um, to select eligible children Last year, we rec we recorded the lottery process. Um, some other districts had recommended that, and we found that to be really helpful so families could see. No names are mentioned. Everything is numbered, but at least you get to see um, that we really do take it, take it seriously, and there are no preferences given. Um, May 5th, families will be notified of their child's status, and students who will be participating in UPK will need to complete the formal registration process with the district, but we'll get you all that information. And I am very much looking forward to tomorrow night's virtual presentation. I do have a little note here about the left-hand side. I will, of the webpage, but I'll, I'll save that. I think I, I hit that home. Um, <laughs> But that's um, a little bit about UPK, and I just want to make sure that everyone has uh, all the information that they need. If there's any questions, families can certainly reach out to myself or Mary Sapone. We are both very passionate about UPK and love to talk to families. So that's where we're at. Awesome. Board members, any questions? questions? I have two, yes. if I may. Um, okay. If 
All right, children who are age eligible to attend kindergarten are not eligible for UPK, but what do families do when they want to hold a child back? They're old enough to go to kindergarten, which makes them ineligible for this. If there were any kind of option for them, would it just be a daycare situation? I, I can, can tell your itch and dancer. Oh, I just lived it. So I, oh, I can tell okay. you that it would be just, they, they based on New York State, they can't go to the, the UPK, mm -hmm. um, but it would be lots of options. So, I mean, families can keep their child home mm -hmm. and, and keep, keep them home another year, or they there are uh, transitional K programs, okay. private programs that they could attend. Okay. They could be at a you know, more of a daycare setting that has a, um, a preschool in it or just a daycare setting. It really falls... Um, I would look at it this way is it doesn't change anything two years ago when we didn't have UPK. It would be the same option. So that okay. that decision to keep a child home one more year based on typically where their birthday falls, mm -hmm. if it's a late fall birthday, um, it would be up to the up to the family on what okay. they want to do. But it's not a school piece yet. Okay. That sounds I mean I should kind of assume that, right. but I, I thought maybe it should be addressed because yeah. I think people would be thinking you know, well, why not? I mean, right. Yeah. I, I think, as Dr. Maloney said, people do, that question comes up a lot, and okay. it makes sense, but it's ultimately that it falls under the New York State regulations for UPK, and I can, you know, our, we can always make arguments, but when New York State says we can't do it, then, then it's not really an argument anymore. Right. But um, it is tough, too, because that means that a student who could be in kindergarten and a family decided not to is taking a spot of a student who is really pre-kindergarten. That's so, okay. That's probably the rationale yep. behind that. Okay, and the other question I had was you mentioned that um, right now the CBOs locate, uh, let's see, all the CBOs are only partnering with, uh, with the district right now, but you said the possibility does exist that um, there could be people, children from other areas coming in. And so I am assuming because our requirement is that they have to follow the Penfield curriculum is that any other child would be following the Penfield curriculum. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And that's a great question, Catherine. Uh, this year, a couple of the CBOs could have done that. They're, they have smaller classrooms, but they chose to remain. They didn't open them up to um, families outside of the, the Penfield program they kept the, the classes small. Yeah. So I don't anticipate a change next year, but the CBO does have that option. Okay, thank you. I have a question. So I know that by New York State's guidelines, we have to partner with CBOs. Did I say that right? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. If per chance down the road in the future, mm -hmm. we decide we also want to have our own in district, would Penfield still receive grant money from New York State for that program if it's housed in Penfield and we're still partnering with CBOs? So I had a feeling that you <laughs> might ask that question. <laughs> so you looked it up, sorry. Uh, so <laughs> yes, I came prepared with the answer. So in the case where districts m have the UPK classes within the district, you still, in order to receive the funding, have to partner for at least 10% of those allocated students. So in our case, 10% would be 11.6. So we'd probably round up for 12 students. Wait, can you say that one more time? Okay, so okay. You, for when, when you are um, taking advantage of the funding from, state, from the state education department, in order to receive that funding, at least a minimum of 10% of students have to be through a partnership at a CBO. Okay. They have to be receiving be receiving UPK programming through a CBO. Okay. So in our case, 116, 10% of that would be 11.6. We'll round up to 12. Okay. Okay. Would have yeah. to be in a CBO. Would have to be receiving a program within a CBO. So what some districts do is they don't offer wraparound care because the program is only five and a half hours. And so if a family needs wraparound care, then they encourage the family to apply to the CBO. But we're still only funded for 116 slots, even if we're choosing to house it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, okay. At Thank this you. point, unless right. the state 
makes gives us more money. Right, okay. right, right. Thank I, you. I have one. I don't think that I heard this. Tomorrow's going to be recorded? Yes, tomorrow will be okay. recorded. I think, and I'm not 100% sure, you'll be able to find that video <laughs> on the, on the left-hand yeah. side of the web page. Thank you. Under the quick links. Is that when you're looking at it? Yep. Be on the left, Got near it. the bottom. And I just want to let everyone know that while Dr. Maloney was presenting, I was I reviewing the FAQ yeah. document and you answered all the questions correctly because they're all everything you talk about oh. is on that website. <laughs> and <coughs> families found last year's recording very helpful. So we it will was. continue. Fingers, you know, with technology, fingers crossed everything goes correctly, but the plan is to record and post it on the website. So that's wonderful. I actually have a question as well. So the teachers have to be certified early childhood, but we are not interviewing or supervising. Is that correct? Like that is all on the... Okay. Nope, that all goes through the CBO. Okay. Yep. And I mean, we, we will help in the sense of... Um, we reviewed transcript for for one of the um, CBOs. We, you know, reached out to some contacts and the, through the colleges to help, but it all is really through the CBO. They manage and, and take care of all that. Gotcha. And then I just, I was curious about the enrollment period and if a family moves in, could they enroll to be on the wait list at that point? Exactly. Okay. When a family moves in, we um, add them to the wait list. Right. Yep. Thank and you. That's a, um, remember when Mary Sapone presented, part of that came up around, she was able to, through the UPK program, get at least a, an offer to spot for all families who had originally signed up and families that moved in um, after. Great. So, yeah. yep. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. That was lovely. And I know that you guys you. have done a lot of work on this for not only tonight's presentation, but before we started this program and it's really awesome and Thank it's you. it's you know it's not it's not um all self-explanatory it there mm -hmm. there are a lot of pieces to um what the state has requires and, and their guidelines so um i understand where so many of the questions come from Absolutely. Thank, you. Thank you okay so we'll turn to <clears throat> Dr. Driffle now has uh, some business updates from the business office. And I apologize in advance, Dr. Driffle, because I think you said you're watching at home, so I'll do my very best uh, to, to pretend I'm you. So tonight's discussion for um, the business office is, uh, you'll see later in this meeting, for the board approval is uh, two facilities approvals. One is for a Bay Trail playground. This is something that we really give a lot of kudos to Dr. Snyder, our new principal at Bay Trail. Um, our Bay Trail students, remember, are sixth grade. Uh, they start in sixth grade through um, eighth grade. And really in conversations with students and um, um, really from students is a, is a, a decision to at recess they go outside and there isn't a playground it's they hang out outside um, you know they might throw the ball around or something like that but really trying to give kids something to do physical activity during that downtime that they do have after lunch and so um, it is an approval for uh, uh, the funding for the Bay Trail Playground design work. Um, it's still a, a ways away, but again, a pretty cool concept to help students out and a lot of students, uh, student feedback on what they wanna see. So it's also the playground that they're looking to build is really also age appropriate. So it's, it's, it's uh, playground equipment that is appropriate for sixth, seventh and eighth grade students. Uh, also, you'll see a design services agreement later in the board meeting. That is around the fact that back um, uh, when the a community voted on our capital project that includes the new facilities um, transportation building, um, um, what we didn't have was a New York State a requirement for um, emission-free um, buses. Mm -hmm. So um, this is for SEI, our architect, who had to do some work to design um, what that uh, electric hookup would look like, the infrastructure. And so again, this comes from the capital project, but because it's a shift, the um, board needs to um, approve that or consider approval. And then uh, just a quick update on our budget development. This is the first expenditure draft review. So I'll just walk through with the board and community uh, where we are for the first 
big picture look you've heard from um, you know transportation and facilities and Dan has been presenting um, but now this is sort of like a big picture look of, of everything together so our budget process here is just the um, in um, where we are with the budget green are things that we have um, already are doing yellow is where we are right now it all leads up to May uh, 16th which is our budget vote Tuesday May 16th so budget to budget factors. So there are some staffing increases that are we're building into next year's budget. One is uh, a group of them is five uh, full time employees. Um, and this is uh, positions that we actually added after like during this year due to needs we have. So one is a K-12 psychologist to help with our uh, students um, who are um, privately placed in outside schools, but we still have to uh, oversee their uh, Committee on Special Education. And by doing that, we have been pulling our current psychologists out of buildings to go support private. So really a need um, to support our psychologists and um, all the work they do for uh, uh, testing for students um, in the CSE process. So we are um, hiring a K-12 psychologist this year, a K-12 music teacher to support uh, strings across the district. We um, also hired a K-5 uh, ESSEL teacher and a Bay Trail special education teacher and a PHS enrichment. So these are positions that, again, were added in this current budget. Um, so we're adding them into the budget to vote for next year. So that's why you'll see these new positions. The other, as we had a great presentation today around integrated co-taught classrooms, so the current projection would be 11 new full-time faculty members for next year. Those will be depending as things flush out, um, either gen ed teachers or special education teachers, depending. So we'll work through that process, but we're projecting um, uh, approximately 11 new teachers um, in our program. This also satisfies uh, what's called the high impact set aside. So there was additional funds provided from the state through foundation aid, um, but the governor did put a caveat that uh, some of that has to support um, students um, in who might be falling behind grade level. And so ICOT obviously is a program that's designed to support students to stay on grade level. Um, and we do uh, know that, that uh, this new positions that we're creating for this does satisfy that requirement requirement from New York State. The other piece or budget to budget factor is the teacher retirement system uh, did finalize the employer contribution rate. That's what the district has to pay is 9.76%. So um, that's the teacher retirement system. Um, so for every uh, uh, hired person in our district, just like every other district, if they are in TRS, um, their retirement uh, pension vehicle, then the district has to pay 9.76% of their salary towards um, towards a fund. So that was uh, in, and it's, it's high, um, but not as high as we thought it was going to be. Yeah, I was going to say. I yep. Think it's a little bit yeah, many better. times you'll see it as uh, there were years way back uh -huh. when it was 20%. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, a, but at least ha we know that number now so we can budget for it. Uh -huh. So just a draft, I'm going to have to go through, I'm going to have to do my slides too because I, um, don't have my vision any longer so um, let me just get my slide so I can make sure I'm reading the numbers correctly so this is the draft budget for um, next school year by function and so it's general support instruction transportation and what's referred to in the state as undistributed um, I will also say now and at the end if anybody in the community has a question specific to any of the budget they can reach out directly to my office or directly to Dr. Driffle's office um, at district office we're always happy to answer any questions when it comes to the budget we want people to to understand and then obviously we're still early but as we go further there'll be much more detail coming out so as you take a look in terms of our breakdown it is an increase overall of 6.77 percent budget to budget um, the draft budget by object, this breaks out uh, wages, contractual obligations the, the, the district has, BOCES, equipment and materials, debt service, employee benefits, and the interfund transfers. And as you take a look down at the, at the um, pie chart below, you can see that the between wages um, is 47% of the budget, um, and employee benefits is another 26% of the budget. And so the reality is the vast majority of all school districts' budget falls on staffing. Um, and that's really, uh, this breaks that up a bit. You know, I'll point out when we look at um, this does 
does incorporate those ICOP, um, uh, um, ICOP positions we talked about, as well as the other five positions that are currently hired for and, and um, uh, for next year. And so uh, again, contractual is contracts we have to um, honor. Our BOCES will see an increase there of uh, just over a million dollars. That really is, um, um, one is BOCES cost to support students has increased, but we also have more students uh, attending BOCES programs. They, um, for many years, had wait lists, and so as those wait lists have opened up, uh, students who were awaiting a placement in outside uh, district uh, through CSE um, have attended, and that does increase. Um, I'll go a little more specific around each one. So the general support here, as you take a look at, is um, uh, pretty flat. The Board of Education increases a bit um, for uh, um, I had a really good answer for this, but it's, I mean, again, it's 6.6 percent. .6 it's six thousand dollars, and I can't quite remember what that was. It's nothing I'll remember. I'll get Dan to talk about that when I apologize, but. Um, it's not the software oh. for, um, I no, I thought so too. That's under the business office. Oh, okay. It'll come back to me, but I think it was to do with, um, it could be board docs that what we're using here or policy service. So I apologize, okay, but right. you guys are so nice, but we'll get the answers. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, again, pretty small increases. The business office is software. We are shifting from uh, WinCap, and most districts are, to a different software program. WinCap is extremely uh, antiquated. Uh, it is run through BOCES, but that's why you see uh, an increase in the business office, really is our software program for everything the business office does, for POs and, um, and uh, payroll and everything else. Um, you'll see the other piece is around operations, again, just dealing with um, the cost of everything going up and uh, some contractual pieces in there. And then um, uh, insurance uh, has increased a bit as well. The nice piece is BOCES administration is flat for a year, so we don't see an increase there for BOCES. Uh, instruction, uh, again, digging through and just kind of picking out some of these areas. The curriculum development budget uh, did go up a bit um, as we continue to do curriculum development across our district. School administration is an increase. Again, a lot of these have to do with contractual um, pieces uh, in, in year to year budget. They are always going to go up a bit. That's by 2.42%. Um, classroom instruction is again when we look at uh, uh, salaries for our general education classroom teachers. Uh, special education is an increase there uh, for um, uh, special education staff is where that looks at. Occupational education has an increase as well due to staffing. Um, library is a decrease a bit. Technology is relatively flat at 3%. Uh, pupil services uh, is an increase there. And the other one I want to focus on, the big one that you'll see there with a, with a, a large increase of 16.5% is interscholastic and co-curricular um, athletics. That's really the athletics program. That is part salary. That is part uh, or stipend. That's also part... Um, um, new programs we're bringing in. We've talked about bringing in um, uh, flag football, which is a new Section 5 support. Uh, the other piece is, as we continue to talk about um, equity and really standing behind it, um, one of the things our athletic director has really dug into and realized is that for a lot of sports, uh, there were things that are required to have that we didn't pay for. And I'll give an example is hockey helmets. And so um, hockey helmets are expensive and uh, they're there for safety and um, forever you just bring your own hockey helmet. Well, if you don't have a hockey helmet, that means you don't get to play hockey. And, and that's not fair. So that's really what we look at. And so now, uh, you know, we've made sure that, and that's just one example across all of athletics to make sure that what you need to have in order to participate will be provided by the district um, as a loaner. Um, for hockey helmets though, for some kids, their hockey helmet is they want their helmet. So just as long as it makes the approval of Section 5 in New York State Athletics for safety, then you can use your own helmet. But we wanna make sure that we can provide for students who are interested in being part of our interscholastic um, athletics um, without having to pay to play is, is the term um, that's mm -hmm. used. Is if it, It's great, everybody can go out for it, but you actually then have to pay to, for all the equipment. 
of course we're not paying for all equipment you know our our jerseys our uniforms all of that is taken care of but you know we're not buying sneakers for every basketball player because they want to wear their own sneakers but if there ever is a time for someone who needs something we're going to make sure that we take care of it so that they can uh, participate the other piece is there is jerseys in um Penfield we've heard from lots of parents over the years is that we uh, you know sort of wear those things out and so there's now um, a, a cycle um, every three years to change out um, athletic uniforms uh, the undistributed is again focused really on these pieces of like you'll see ERS is an increase we just talked about that we knew what the rate was set at so that it does show a, a relatively large mm -hmm. increase of 14% um, payroll taxes are there. We do have a workers' comp insurance that actually our insurance has gone down, so we have some savings there. Um, other benefits there is uh, the $107,000, and that really um, focuses around our uh, some contractual benefits. And um, um, again, when we look at the big picture, it's a huge jump, but we're talking about a difference of $107,000. I didn't do a really good job uh, explaining that. I apologize, um, but we'll have Dan circle back to this. Um, and the other piece I want to point out is debt interest. So like our, this is the debt we hold for capital projects and you'll see an increase in both of those for the debt interest. It's an increase of 46%. But as a reminder to the community that we get aid back on that, on that, um, uh, debt. And so we actually, while we're, um, looking like it's a large increase through the way that New York State budgets and pays back for capital projects, um, there's still no, um, no cost to the uh, community when it comes to the large um, capital project we currently have uh, moving forward. And then, that percent doesn't look right what's that? No. Okay. That percent seems off. Maybe that's off. Could be. Look, if it's going from 401 to 588 and the difference is 187, that's not a 46. I mean, I'm not. I can't do math that quick in my head, but that's. We'll seems, have Dan take a yeah, look at that it. That number seems not exactly 46%. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll have, I will make a note and have Dan take a look okay. at that number. Thank you. Um, this is uh, the matching to the potential revenue. And so um, this is, you'll see a lot of red arrows about not decided and pending New York State, but want to kind of talk through where we are. So we know that costs are up, but we also know that um, it's being well supported by projected revenue. When we talk about revenue, we're specifically talking about New York State uh, um, uh, funding education in, uh, in a strong manner this year. And so we'll likely, likely not need to levy up to our calculated cap. So as we know, we could go up to almost 4%. We're not uh, a little over 4%. We're not looking at levying up to our calculated cap. And potentially, we could have another year of uh, no levy increase uh, in our community. And that's something we're really talking um, a lot about with our board and with uh, internally. So that's where we're kind of looking now. New York State education funding, though, is still subject to legislative approval. So we don't believe anything until we see it from the state. And uh, that's this um, chart, I think, is nice. It does take a look at if we were to have a 0% levy, so our uh, budget would stay flat from um, what we collect in property taxes, our local share, um, and then all else sort of put into play here. And the New York State um, school funding stays where it currently is proposed and projected, um, then, you know, near the end of this, we would look at having a, a, our assigned fund balance is still in question, but ultimately uh, would be an increase of uh, uh, potentially 6.7% budget to budget, um, and that's without using any assigned fund balance, and that's also with leaving a 0% um, uh, year to year levy. So as we look at this, it's great to get uh, to see New York State um, funding education as we have advocated that they do. Um, and that supports our current programs and allows us to dig deeper into areas like integrated co teach that we know will support students. And then our next steps here for uh, budget is uh, the next board meeting, uh, BOCES budget review, appropriations updates, uh, revenue updates, where the money's coming from, approve the ballot propositions, approve legal notices, have Dan go over the two questions that Tom couldn't answer at this board meeting because it's in the back of my brain. I can't get it to the front right now. And then April 1st, uh, New York State budget is finalized. And then um, we'll bring that final uh, budget to the board for 
for review and, and approval so we can move forward with our vote um, on May 16th. Um, are there any board discussions or questions? And I kick myself because I know no, both of those answers and can't think of them off the top of my head. Board members, I'm sure you all have 12 questions for Dr. Putnam. Any questions? No, I don't. I don't really have any questions, and I think I lied about that number. I, I think, think it was right. right. I think it was right. Well, you know, yeah, I looked I at the five hundred thousand and was going backwards, and I was like, "That seems wrong." But if you go the other way, it's yeah, right. right. So that I think when you go through a lot of it and that's the pieces, it's really important to look at the percent increase or decrease, but also the amount of funds we're talking right. about. So, right. so in certain areas where you talk about a. a 50% increase, but you're talking about $100,000 is trying to lay that out and, and take a look at the why um, things are shifting. So, yeah. well, and I have to remember that when $100,000 seems like a whole lot yeah, of money, well, yeah, when you're looking at a budget of, you know, a hundred plus million dollars, it's not a really large percentage. Yeah. Yeah. So, but Hey, uh, you know, a dollar is a dollar. Well, so yeah. it, it I doesn't like to, matter. I like to know what's going on. I think next year too, when we look at our next meeting, when we uh, dig into the revenue side is what's important because it's also that reminder of w what we see is what actually collected from local share is much less because of state uh, aid and also because of BOCES aid that we get paid back on and debt service, how we set that up in order to make sure that we're getting that aid back from New York State. Mm -hmm. And that's that reminder too. But again, um, we, as the board knows, and uh, we look deeply in this and I apologize um, that I couldn't answer or two questions that I will think of later when you can't sleep. when I can when sleep it it'll be out. I'll, I'll I always have Dan more present. questions after yeah. I process anyway and I know it's really just job it. security for Dan yeah, that like I can't like be amazing <laughs> so we're good you go. but okay. I know we had Thank you. A, you know we it was really broken down in our packet so yeah. there's you yeah. know pages and pages of numbers and so good. we'll have lots of questions good good for Dan bring next all time. to Dan anybody <laughs> in the community <laughs> wants to ask questions Dan is always available just um uh, via email or, or phone so yep. awesome yep all right so we're that concludes superintendent reports wonderful so we are moving on to item five board members facilities on December 14th the district voters approved a capital project for work at various school buildings and a new transportation facility the state mandate around zero emission buses was not originally in the scope as um, dr. Putnam described so may I have a motion please in a second that we approve the submitted proposal dated February 16 2023 for the necessary design engineering and administration for additional professional services for the planning and implementation of zero emission buses this proposal calls for a fixed total fee of ninety two thousand dollars which is equivalent to a four point three eight percent of the project costs associated with the zero emission scope of the project so moved second Questions or comments on that? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Thank you. We're moving on to item six, where we're um, approving the, um, what are we approving? Cooperative purchase. Oh, the cooperative purchase contract. This is for the Bay yeah. Trail playground that Tom described mm -hmm. yep. I was getting there sorry it was it was there it was in the <laughs> see now it's catchy mm -hmm. <laughs> whereas the Board of Education of the Penfield Central School District has determined that it is in the best interest of the school district to contract with landscape structures Inc for the acquisition and installation of playground materials and equipment under the scope of the source well contract number 010521 LSI is outlined in proposals dated February 2nd and February 13, 2023. Be it resolved as follows that the Board of Education hereby authorizes the President of the Board, the Superintendent of Schools, or their designee to issue a purchase order to acquire the materials, equipment, and services outlined in the Landscape Structures proposal and take all necessary all actions necessary or convenient to proceed in connection with the project. May I please have a motion in a second? So, so we'll, a second. Questions or comments on that? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Thank you. Moving on to item seven. This is where we're approving the new UPK site that Dr. Maloney discussed. 
Whereas on January 26, 2023, the Penfield Central School District issued a request for proposal for universal pre-kindergarten program services pursuant to the procedures set forth in section 151-1.6 of the commissioner's regulations. And whereas following the RFP issuance, the school district received and evaluated a proposal from one vendor, and whereas in accordance with the recommendation of the school district's administration, the Board of Education wishes to award the contract for universal pre-kindergarten program services to the vendor Inspire Crayon Campus. Be it resolved that the board approves the award of the contract for universal pre-kindergarten program services pursuant to the RFP issued on January 26, 2023, and that the proposal terms of contract attached to the RFP are hereby approved and the superintendent of schools is authorized and directed to execute the same on behalf of the school district to take all necessary steps to carry out the terms of some agreement. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Questions or comments on that? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Thank you. So now we're uh, up to our policy review. We have two policies up for second reading approval today. We have policy 8251 which is our therapy dogs in school policy. So this was just a review um, from, was this from the policy manual? Is that why we're reviewing or just reviewing yep, this no, annually? No, because in the okay. 8,000 series. Okay, that's yes. what I thought. And so we had one public comment um, or email mm -hmm. that we addressed in, in policy and made a few changes to that policy. So I think you guys have seen that. Mm -hmm. And then our second policy up for public comment, or up for, Second read and approval is 1515, which is public comment at board meetings. So for this policy, we received, um, we received two emails that had some suggestions that the policy committee addressed and made a couple changes to. We received a couple other emails in general about this policy, uh, two emails that were in support of taking a pause and creating a policy. Uh, we had one email that expressed concern about the decision to take a pause at all. And then we had an email not really discussing the process or the, any, no changes really to the policy, but really about the process of how, how we create a policy. Is, would that be accurate? I just want to make sure I'm sharing that correctly. Um, so we did make some changes to that policy and we did have, um, legal or legal take a look at that policy as we have done previously from time to time if we have a policy that especially a new one yeah especially a new one mm -hmm. correct um questions board members on that no, no. no. all right I'm working things all right, so then our action items may I have a motion, please, in a second to approve policy 8251 and policy 1515. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Thank you. So we're going to move on to committee meetings, but we don't have a lot of people here, so <laughs> we might not have a lot to talk about. Oh, our first one is info exchange. So I don't, I'm not sure. If yeah, well, I was traveling. That's what I wondered. Yes, I was literally on the road when this meeting took place. But MCSBA has these, um, some of these meetings are, uh, you can, information exchange is one that, that uh, you can attend via Zoom mm -hmm. and they, uh, they tape it and post it. And I don't know if they do that with all the meetings but um, they do with this. So I was able to watch it, and I did, and um, I was very excited about the topic. This is about Eastport um, and Eastridge. Uh, Mary Grill, the superintendent, and Mark Anson and Mark Falcone from Eastridge, they presented. And this was how, uh, this is all about how they have implemented Eastport in their, um, in their district. And if you recall, I don't know, some weeks ago, we, I had a question about what is, what is it even? And when Tom explained what it was, I was sitting here and like, oh boy, here we go, you know, computers, gaming, like what's the world coming to? And uh, then, I, then I saw this whole, this whole situation from a different perspective, how, how it 
just grabs a certain population out of our, yeah, out of the students. And it was very exciting to hear and uh, I, I got very inspired. So a couple of things I wanted to point out to the group. Um, okay, let me just see, I, you know. So Catherine. Yes. While you're looking. Uh, during the meeting, Dr. Putnam was texting we need this. Yeah. We need this. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. And I I finally said, we already have a meeting scheduled with BOCES about this. Mm -hmm. I we're on it. So oh, this is wonderful. We are on it. Um, it is very exciting. We for a number of years we have been looking and trying to, you know, if, if you'll remember, prior to the pandemic. Penfield as a district was not students. We weren't one to one in terms of devices. Mm -hmm. And so Jason right. DeLorenz as our director of technology has done an amazing job getting us up to where we need to be and working with BOCES to determine what, um, what we need in terms of the hardware and the software. And so we're, we're working in the background to hopefully make eSports an option for students next school year. Th that is That's wonderful exciting. news to me. I have to say, what I did not realize about the whole concept and how it was implemented is, is, is who this reaches. It reaches a group of students who wouldn't be doing extracurricular um, under any circumstances, you know, because they're not sports people and they're not musicians and maybe they're shyer or it, more shy or um, just, you know, a little, I don't fit, whatever. They just don't see themselves as the type that would do extracurricular. So that's one aspect of it. The inclusivity behind it is another thing. It's, it's co-ed, very few extra, you know, when it's sports, mm -hmm. it's, it's not co-ed, mm -hmm. but this is co-ed. This is all different kinds of abilities. Um, and then there's the other things that they learn, like developing their, their skills in communication, collaboration, um, you know, all of that. Um, and then there's money for scholarships. There's uh, competition. There's just, there's so, so many opportunities for students who would, you know, who would otherwise be going home and playing their video games. Mm -hmm. This I'll way, right, you know, yeah. this way they are collaborating with their peers. Scott Dreschler brought up tonight about peers learning from peers. I mean, that, Eastridge was going on about all of the different, uh, the plus sides of it. And then the challenges, like what you mm -hmm. said, you know, you know, the equipment and who's going to coach it. And then, you know, what is it? Is it a club? Is it a sport? You know, those are things that are the incidental um, things to be worked out and figured out. But then when you take a look at it from that perspective of another whole group of students who would otherwise feel like, you know, I'm not like this one and I'm not like that one. Well, we're all unique and we're not like this one or that one, but when you're going to, to high school and this one's got an extracurricular for this, that, or the other thing, and then somebody else says, well, I do too, you know, and then it's in their interest and works with their abilities. And, and I just found it very, very exciting. So I'm so pleased to hear that you're already on the case. Um, but of, of the meetings I've um, participated in this year, this one by far has gotten me the most excited. I think it's great. I would, it's having awesome. been there in person, I would. The only change I'd make is that this one comes in second to the solar eclipse, which is happening next year. <laughs> oh, you know what? I forgot about yeah, that. But that yeah. we have that's our not, glasses for the solar I, eclipse. And I've got too. mine. That's right. Yes. The couple pieces I just want to mm -hmm. uh, piggyback on on what Catherine talked about, and is that you know for the community is. <clears throat> We are. We have been investigating this. I think uh, East Ranaquite, Mary Grow, East Ridge High School did a great job presenting really the, the how they got there. And one of the pieces that Catherine mentioned that that I think is important is they did a student interest survey and they had 80 high school kids interested. And when they dug deeper into the students interested, 
these are 80 kids, and, and maybe Penfield will be different, but there in East Aranaquay, they, they had never played a sport for the school. They, had, they were not involved in any other extracurricular clubs or activities. So they really saw it as like this untapped, like we're always talking about bringing kids in and connecting kids and partnerships and, and having kids you know, feel connected because we know from the culturally responsive framework, we know from research that when students feel connected to something like school, they're, they're in more, they, they show up. And we see that with students who, who um, are involved in athletics. They might just be coming to school and doing, going through the motions because they love athletics, right? And that's okay. We want to make sure we, we have that, that connection for every kid. So I got really excited uh, listening to that in terms of the students they brought in. The, that piece around, they, and they did a great job presenting, like gaming really is, they're all doing it. And they even talked about, I think, like as administrators, like they struggled with, yeah. we're, we were worried about kids gaming, but now we're going to have a club focused on gaming. Right. And what they really came to with a lot of research and, and talked a bit about it is, they're gaming anyway. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, if we can't stop that, then at least how do we do it in a safe spot where they can build and learn from each other? Right. The scholarship piece, and this is, uh, I want to say this right, but what I learned, which was amazing, is that, and I did not know this, and then I went on a whole evening Google search, which is amazing, is that in terms of revenue, um, eSports is ranked second in revenue only behind the NFL. So eSports as a national uh, association um, brings in more money than baseball, basketball, NFL still wins because you think about ad revenue, like, mm -hmm. it's everything that has to do with the sport. So really interesting. And then they talked about, which is near and dear to me with a couple of teenagers, is they talked about like what games to play. Right. And so games, just like movies, have a rating. And so they were pretty strong that, you know, although esports might do uh, ratings all the way up to mature, at the high school level, it would be teen, you know, so that, that would be what they could play. And then at the middle school, they also built a team and they do um, only the, the games rated everyone that everybody right. could play. But again, really essential skills. I talked about the advocacy that comes from it and about kids who might not have been connected. They got jerseys for them. They do oh, updates nice. when, oh, they, oh. when they win, you know, or like during the competitions. And then if you start Googling college scholarships for eSports related, it's, it's, it's millions and millions of dollars and it's scholarships from places like RIT, MIT. They're, they're seeing this as a new wave to really um, build upon skill sets. And it takes that next step because a lot of our kids who are really in deep in, in gaming also know their way all around a computer. They build computers, they mm -hmm. dig into it. So it's not what I refer to as it's not the gaming that maybe my generation and others know, which is sitting in your basement playing Nintendo by yourself or like with the person sitting next to you. Yeah. Like these kids are online, they're meeting people yeah. around the world, they're having conversations. We wanna make sure we control it, make sure it's safe. Mm -hmm. But once you start talking about the millions and millions of dollars of scholarships and we're like, if we don't dig into it a little bit, like we wanna make sure that every kid graduating from high school has every opportunity to go to college if that's what they want and here's a scholarship um, access that they, they might have an opportunity for so I was excited I did text Leslie and <laughs> she got right back to me telling me to calm down and uh, but it was it was great and I honestly and Catherine you mentioned it is like you said you know like you were you were not interested and then you see it so anybody watching at home deep breath I know it's yeah. a new concept but but um, districts like East Aranaquates in, but so is Holly. Like, yeah. so are these little districts mm -hmm. much smaller than us who are really finding a lot of support of students in, in bringing them together. Because um, gaming doesn't matter what your race is, what your gender is, what your um, exactly. what your if you if what your ability is. It's all about whether you can play that game. So that's right. And I cool. always said that about music. It's a it's yep. a universal language. You know, like you could go to you know, Canada or the Dominican Republic or Russia or anywhere you could go. If you have the same piece of sheet music, you can all, if you know how to yep. play it, you all can play the same music. And with gaming, I think it's, it's kind of like that, you know, I, I mean, uh, as long as there's not that language barrier, but um, th those are skills. It's just, it, the, the skills are amazing. And for the skeptics, and and I seriously, if this was up to me before I saw that, I would say absolutely not. No, no, no. Um, 
but I never looked at it for what, for first of all, who it attracts and what it can do for them. Yep. You know, it's that, that um, interaction and, you know, commitment because mm -hmm. What, when some of the kids were interested and then they found out what it was about and it would be a commitment, some said, no, I don't, I don't want a commitment. Fair. That's, that's to because that's what it takes and you need to know that about yourself that I'm not in a place now where I want to make a commitment. But then when the ones who do want to make a commitment, then it's like, oh, I don't want to go, but I made a commitment. You know, you were learning all the time about these soft skills and I think um, some very important life skills and then to belong so yeah. it's i just um yeah that's exciting it, it, it's a different perspective mm -hmm. which i was very surprised about yeah awesome so well, that's exciting it. i can't wait to hear about leslie's meeting maybe I, it'll be on yeah. the left side of the <laughs> website we <laughs> no that one might be on the right <laughs> side because the left side is for Good. upk <laughs> okay so let's see so mark is not here for labor relations I think Tom and I did not make executive committee, right? Uh, I made executive committee. Oh, you made committee, committee. okay, because yes. I did not. Lovely. Uh, yep, so I went, that was uh, board presidents and superintendents. Uh, you it was don't all that usually report on those, was, do you? No, no, it's usually I let the board president, but I will just share I with just you, um, the big focus there for us is they did talk about the, and Lisa's done a nice job, sharing with the board the website monroe county school boards uh they debriefed the legislative breakfast a bit oh. uh, with everybody um and then talk through that um amy thomas who the executive director of monroe county school boards uh, discussed um, making her way to um, all the boards so she's completed the west side of monroe county and i know she's coming soon i think we just saw an email or i did so i think maybe the meeting in april but nice. she'll be here to um to just uh, touch base and nice. do some FaceTime with uh, with the board, okay. and then um, the the group you know discussed uh, you know her evaluation for for the end for this year. So um, it was a nice nice meeting. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. No problem. Okay, and then Chris is not here for legislative and code of conduct. Yeah, that's the week I was out of town, so I missed that meeting. <laughs> Um, and Nicole's not here. Do you want to speak to that meeting, Absolutely. please? Thank um, you. We spent time in small groups having work sessions to do some um, code of conduct writing and development for four areas, our rights and responsibilities, our glossary. Um, we had our students connected to dress code and electronics. And we also had um, some writing on the letter from the committee, an introduction to the code of conduct. So that happened. And we're really excited to in remind the community to join us on March 29th, which we'll have an opportunity to take a look at the code of conduct, the parts that are um, developed in draft to support just some awareness around where we are in the process. Um, I think one of the places that we really want to do some side-by-side -side comparison is our current code relative to how we may be responding and some interventions that we want to have in place that we're looking to build as part of the new code. So later this month, we'll have more uh, development and we'll, we're going to be planning for the experience that we'll share with families as part of the community conversation with the code for March 29th from 6 to 7.30. So there'll be information coming out um, from me to our families and our community to just invite them to join us. But I think we're moving along. Um, we're, we're getting further along in our process and there is, again, it's always nice to note that we have students present, mm -hmm. um, we have board members present, we have families present, um, and we have faculty as part of our code of conduct committee. Thank you. And DEI core committee, do you wanna to speak to that? Sure, we just met last night. Um, we, our primary focus was looking at our equity long um, range plan. And what our big focus was really thinking about what things we still need to consider before we're putting it out to everybody in our community. 
And some of our big things were making sure that it's a living document. It's not something that's necessarily going away. And how are we going to make sure that we're living with this document, looking at cyclical review to see what, um, what we are accomplishing, making sure that all of our stakeholders are really comfortable with the document, getting more our stakeholders' eyes on the document. Um, really powerful conversations we broke out into small groups and really just people are being really thoughtful about making sure that everyone that's you, responsible, well, I don't want to say responsible, but everyone that's vested in it, making sure that they're really comfortable with it, and really as a district, just making sure that we're arming people with the skill set to manage it. You know, we talked a little bit, like in our group, about like as a teacher, like you really focus on one thing that first year and you really hone those skills and you get really good at it. And then the next year, you kind of layer on, you mm -hmm. pick that next skill set so that you're constantly building. Um, but really powerful conversation. A lot of thoughtful work has gone into it. So did you want to add anything, Tasha? Thank you. Okay. I do not think we have unfinished business, board members. So that brings us to new business. And so this is the time when we um, nominate for the BOCES board. So for BOCES 1, um, we have, so each component district sends a representative to the BOCES board. So this is our time to nominate our person. Do they, they do three year terms too? Okay, I couldn't remember. Yep. So that's why we don't do this all the time. That's why, uh -huh. that's why I couldn't remember. Yeah. Well, I think it throws you too, because uh, I think um, the Penfield uh, rap, uh, Penfield is, is Lisa Latin, but she filled in for a term. So it hasn't been three years, correct? Has oh, she, is that why? I think oh, so, I yeah. I know, that's why I was like Yeah, she years. filled in for somebody who stepped away. Maybe that's so, why. Mm -hmm. Must have been for Maybe. I think so. Yeah, yes. I don't know. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah. Okay. Because it doesn't feel like it's been three years. I was going to say, right. that was a fast three years. But, but it maybe it was. Three years. I don't I'll know. find out. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Barb would know. I know. I don't know. All right, where are we? Okay. This year, there are three seats on the BOCES board to fill. They are currently held by representatives from Honey Roy, Falls, Lima, East Rochester, and Penfield districts. Each district nominate. I just said that. <laughs> okay. May it resolve that Miss Lisa Latin, residing in the Penfield Central School District, is hereby nominated as a candidate for membership on the Monroe One BOCES board for a term of office to begin July 1, 2023, and end on June 30th, 2026. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Questions or comments on that? Mm -hmm. All those in favor? All in favor? None opposed? Thank you. Now we're done. Yay. May I have a motion, please, in a second, that we adjourn tonight's meeting at 8.33 p.m.? So second. Questions or comments on that? All those in favor? Mm -hmm. All in favor? None opposed? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.